Okay, uh, good evening students. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for Education USA India's webinar, Friday webinar on funding your graduate education in the United States. We have with us, we have the great pleasure of having Sri Ramakrishnan um, uh, with us from the Whitman School. Syracuse University. Uh, Shri is the Assistant Director of Graduate Recruitment at the School of Business at Syracuse University and she has years of experience in, in guiding students as well as has been an international student in, in the US uh, a few years ago. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Shri uh, and Shri, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You forgot to mention I was a former Education USA advisor. Absolutely. With the Chennai office, she used to work with Education USA uh, in 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 our Chennai office, and uh, uh, now she works for Whitman. And it's it's wonderful to connect with a, with a colleague and be able to collaborate and benefit from 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 their learnings and their experiences. I hope it's a great session, and I hope all of you students who've uh, taken the time to log into our session today uh, benefit from it. Please feel free to interact by writing um, by by writing your questions into the chat box and uh, Shri and I will be very, very happy to, to help you in any way possible today. Thank you. Shri, over to you. Okay, Anand, thank you so much for organizing this and for um, inviting me to do today's webinar. Um, the way I have set this up for today is to not have too many PowerPoint slides, but just to go very quickly about certain types of sources of funding for graduate education, and then I want to open up the floor for questions. So uh, students can start typing in your questions into the chat box. That would be helpful as I keep going along um, this webinar. Uh, the one thing that I would like to know is if there are specific business students or what your programs of interest might be. If you're in STEM, if you're specifically engineering, whatever, what have you, just type it into the chat box and then we'll take it from there towards the end. So I want to start out basically by saying, um, for sources of funding, uh, when you're looking at funding your graduate education, your primary sources are always going to be parents and possibly extended family in some situations. But then um, you also have some possibilities of going through external sources. Um, I know in India, banks offer educational loans and uh, most students do go that route. Um, you possibly will know more about which banks are offering you competitive rates and uh, which others are not. And so you have more knowledge about that than I can offer you. Uh, one thing that I want to touch upon is competitive scholarships, both corporations and nonprofit, and I'll go over this in just a little bit. And also internship options, which are program related and non-program related. Okay, and there are certain caveats to each of those situations, and we'll go over that as well in just a second. Um, most students think that when they apply to U.S. universities, the university is um, supposed to grant you full funding and scholarship. Know that this is not always the case. It depends on the university. It depends on the availability of funds at the university and the particular program that you are applying for. Uh, it also depends on the numbers of students that are actually applying to that particular university during that particular year. There are a lot of factors that impact funding availability. So rather than turn away students with zero funding, universities sometimes have a policy of providing partial funding. Okay, so what partial funding does is offers uh, you either a scholarship to a certain uh, scholarship for a certain amount that can be applied towards your tuition but not necessarily provide you any money uh, that could be applied towards your living expenses. So while a portion of your tuition is taken care of, it might not necessarily um, be enough for you to live on that um, amount that you get. So you have to make alternate arrangements. So rather than bear the full brunt of the fees uh, and tuition, you would be uh, paying a lower amount um, owing to this partial scholarship. So this works in a couple of different ways. So one example that I put out here is merit-based scholarships. Merit-based scholarships uh, can be used and applied only towards tuition and fees, cannot be used towards living expenses. It will not be cash in your account, in your uh, student account that allows you to live off of that money, okay? 
So for instance, uh, given the example of Whitman School of Management, we at Whitman School actually offer um, scholarship to our full-time MBA students and our full-time MS students. Our MS programs are only one year long. So for instance, MS Accounting or MS in Finance or Entrepreneurship. These programs are one year long and the maximum amount that we can offer is up to $10,000 because there is a cap. Now for our MBA program, it's a two year full time program. So the amount might be different, but whatever amount every student who gets admitted into the program, every student is given a certain amount. The amount will vary from student to student, but it will go only directly towards tuition which means the student still has to take care of their own living expenses, their health insurance, and other expenses that might be entailed with the program. Um, one other thing I've mentioned here is about assistantships. This is, again, considered to be partial funding. It is not necessarily full funding. In rare cases, it can be part of full funding. But assistantships usually are of three, uh, three types. I will address the two most commonly talked about assistantships um, in a couple of, in, in the next slide or so. But um, know that they don't always have to um, be offered to every student in every department or in every field and not necessarily with the same, um, what should I say, with the, with the same FTE or employment status. So in some cases, it can only be 10 hours per week in some cases, it can be 20 hours per week. As an international student, you can work only 20 hours per week. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And we'll go over that in just a second. The next one I have is full funding from universities. In, in uh, rare cases, you do have situations where a university might offer you a full tuition waiver and also give you a stipend to subsist on. Now, the stipend can just be provided in the form of a scholarship. Uh, or it can be tied in with an assistantship, whether research or teaching, or, or it is just provided based on your GPA. That, again, depends on the university itself and the particular department that you're applying for. Um, fellowships usually happen for uh, PhD programs um, where the fellowship could either be offered by the graduate college or be specific to a particular department um, and be offered at that particular university, not necessarily across all universities. And again, they might be limited as well. And the last resource you have is, of course, on-campus job. Depending on how difficult your program is and how rigorous it is, um, you will have to decide whether you can actually take on an on-campus job or not and for how many hours. Uh, the on-campus job should not be uh, interfering with your class schedule and uh, also should not affect your overall GPA. This is something that is very um, important to keep in mind because the international student uh, office at every university will be monitoring your GPA every semester. And if they feel that the amount of time that you're putting in to an on-campus job is actually um, making you perform um, less in your classes, they can uh, request the hiring department to, act to actually take away your, your job. So you always want to make sure that um, the number of hours that you can work on campus is only 20 hours per week when school is in session and that your uh, overall GPA cannot uh, go below 3.0. Typically, it is 3.0. But in um, schools, uh, you might want to verify with the International Services Office if that um, if they have a specific uh, GPA that they are looking for. But usually, it is at least 3.0. Okay. All right. So moving on, sources of funding for assistantship. So the two that I have listed here are the most commonly talked about forms of assistantships, either teaching or research assistantship. There we one also called uh, graduate assistantships, which are not very common and which also do not give you um, uh, the, the same amount uh, in relation to the teaching or research assistantships. Okay, um, graduate assistantships might be very specific to a particular semester when there is some excess money possibly left in the department and they want to help out a student or. Uh, 
require assistance with a specific administrative project or so, and therefore hire a student as a graduate assistant to help out with that project and pay the uh, student uh, some amount of money that would be looked at as an assistantship. But the most common ones are the teaching assistantships and the research assistantships. Most of you have possibly heard about this from your own seniors or from your friends, but um, here's a breakdown of what this would entail. Te both are available in limited quantities. The thing you want to understand are the parameters that are set by the university in terms of these assistantships and how they actually impact your funding. Okay. Now, Syracuse University happens to be a private university. So because it is a private university, everybody across the board pays the same amount in tuition and fee. So tuition is charged as um, amount per credit. So it is, for, for instance, for 2014-15, the amount is $1,341 per credit. So for instance, if you have to uh, if you are applying for a two-year full-time program and the number of credits you need to complete in order to earn your degree from the program is 54 credits, then your tuition and fees will be calculated 54 times 1,341, okay? Now, that is just tuition and fees because this is a private university. In public universities, state universities, you have what are called um, in-state tuition uh, categories and out-of-state tuition categories, sometimes also referred to as re domestic or residential and non-residential tuition and fees. Now, when you're applying to places like that, you want to see how your assistantship is actually going to impact the funding um, in terms of your um, in-state tuition waiver and out-of-state tuition waiver. Okay. So in, in my university, for instance, when I graduated, I graduated from the University of Arizona. And in, at the University of Arizona, there was a requirement that if a student got a teaching or a research assistantship for a particular semester, they were required to not necessarily take nine credits of classes, which means you did not have to enroll in three classes, you could enroll in two classes, take six credits, which would amount to six credits because each class is roughly about three credits. Um, you could take six credits that semester that you were a teaching or a research assistant, but your tuition would be lowered that you pay one fourth of the amount of non-residential tuition fees. So it was not that if you got an assistantship, you pay, you got a full waiver or you were exempt from paying that amount. It was just a lesser amount that you were paying and you also received uh, a, a sort of a salary, okay, um, for your actual uh, amount of work. And your assistantship could not exceed 20 hours per week during that semester when school was in session. Okay, so there are all these different aspects that you want to keep in mind and explore um, and understand why you are seeking assistantships and looking for possible opportunities. Now, these are determined by the university in both cases, but then where teaching assistantships might be specific to a department, where every department might have a set number of teaching assistantships, depending again with faculty member. Research assistantships are very specific to faculty members. And so if a faculty member does not have enough research grants to cover the funding, he or she will not be able to hire you. So no point in writing to the faculty member and bombarding them with emails when you know that assistantships are not available. The other thing you want to keep in mind is that while all of you have completed your undergrad courses in India and you are applying for a master's level program, know that the way you have completed your courses and what is expected in teaching undergrads over here in the US are very different. So not everybody will qualify for being able to teach an undergrad level course for various reasons. Part of it could be that the content that you are expected to teach in that particular class is something that you might have covered as just one module in your particular um, course, or it could be that um, the professor does not know you as well in your very first semester and therefore does not have the confidence to give the class to you. 
but might give it to your senior or another person who's already been here for at least a year because they have worked with that student. So a lot of different factors will, uh, will affect your ability to build that level and be able to secure an assistantship. This is not to discourage you from seeking assistantships, but this is to encourage you to actually think carefully before you just send out blanket emails to professors um, asking to become their teaching or research assistant. Okay. Um, you also want to be very careful when you are thinking about writing to professors in other departments um, and seeking assistantships in those departments. For instance, um, I know that every university will have uh, a writing center or an English uh, department where they do English 101 uh, or English composition as, it, as it's uh, typically called. Most of you might think about going and securing a position there to be able to teach writing composition. Now, being able to be a good writer and actually teaching how to write and communication skills are two different things. Um, it's not to say that you cannot write well, but it's to say, can you actually teach that class? The same thing applies for mathematics. All of you might be engineers, but to be able to actually teach concepts to an undergraduate class requires a different kind of skill. So think about these different things and also figure out uh, your, um, your particular skill sets and try to highlight them in your resume and um, engage in conversation with people blended in your expecting. Okay. Um, one other thing I would emphasize is you might want to think about um, increasing your um, analytical skills, either with Google Analytics, um, Excel, advanced Excel, any other statistical uh, skills that you might be able to gain before you come here, because those might actually be helpful for you um, in, in setting yourself apart from other students who would otherwise have similar qualifications like yourselves. Um, moving on, here's what I'm... Yeah, sorry, there's a question by Saurabh and he says, is it true that professors consider the TOEFL score while hiring a student as a teaching assistant? Yes, yes and no. So when uh, professors uh, talk to students, there are lots of different things that they would be looking at, which is A, in terms of you are a brand new student walking into their department, why should they take you on as a TA? They have no clue about how good you might be in the classroom, right? Um, for instance, when students come into our uh, program here in the MBA program, they are qualified possibly on paper, but nobody receives a teaching assistantship in their first year. You have to necessarily, excuse me, you have to necessarily at least take one course with the particular uh, professor before you can be hired as a TA because he or she must know what kind of a student you are and whether you understand the concept well enough to be able to uh, communicate those concepts well to other folks. Now, granted, you might be teaching undergraduate students, but even as, um, as a TA for undergrad students, you could be hired in different capacities. In one capacity, it could be to actually teach the course, which, which is a particular section of the course, which is the example that I gave you earlier of teaching English or math or, or writing or in your particular uh, discipline of study. Um, another aspect could be as a grader. You could be hired by a faculty member just to help with grading multiple assignments that they might have throughout the semester or the midterm. And uh, that might be a possibility that you could explore, which, could, which would only be for 10 hours per week, typically. It will not be longer than that, okay? Um, all right, so. um, and there was another question by Prawal on uh, on teaching assistantships. What are the prerequisites that professors expect to hire? What are the prerequisites for becoming, I think, a TA is, is, is his question. Prabhu, where are you joining us from? Please type in where you're joining us from. <clears throat> While Sri responds to your question. OK, so again, this is. Um, related to what I was saying earlier in terms of uh, 
how a professor has to get to know you before he or she can hire you as a teaching assistant. You might be good on paper, um, coming from a reputed institution. You could have fantastic um, GPA. You could have a fantastic GRE or GMAT score, as the case might be. Your TOEFL score might be great. But if you are not the person who can actually hold a conversation, how are you going to communicate in class? And how would I know that uh, if I wanted to hire you as a TA just looking at your uh, paperwork? I wouldn't, right? So it depends on um, a few things that you want to think about or keep in mind. A, how are you communicating and whether you would actually be able to get a position as a TA or maybe as an RA. So with your good professional skills or with your good um, academic skills on paper, you might stand a better chance of getting a research assistantship if you're able to meet with faculty and actually explain why you want to be a research assistant or how you can help with particular types of analysis because of your skills in you know, advanced Excel or any of the statistical tools like SPSS, SATA, SAS, MATLAB, any what have you. Um, these are all skills that would help you. But Google Analytics is another one that might help you too. And you can teach yourself Google Analytics for free from your Google website. Um, but are there any specific, is there a specific formula to become a teaching assistant? There isn't. Um, some of the things that professors look for, if they want only a grader, they might want to see how well you communicate, what, what kind of um, personality you have, and whether you are able to understand and comprehend what they are saying to you. Uh, sometimes that happens depending on your course schedule and availability of funds for graders in your department. So if your department specifically have, let's say, five teaching assistantships available to teach a particular course, and there are actually PhD students in line ahead of you, you're not going to get them because PhD students will get the priority. If it turns out that there are X number of assistantships available in your department and they require to teach uh, a particular section of the course um, for the entire semester, and that happens to be um, offered, let's say, on two days of the week, then you could approach the department or the faculty member because, or the program coordinator, graduate coordinator, they will give you a, a listing of uh, criteria. And if you fulfill that criteria, you could submit your resume and you could possibly apply for those positions. And then you will be interviewed if they have multiple folks uh, or multiple applicants. And then the department will make a decision on who gets that assistantship. So, um, and that might be internal criteria or uh, evaluation uh, rubric that they would have based on which they would go about doing that and picking the right candidate for, for that. So it again, varies from department to department um, based on availability of funds and the number of assistantships available, okay? So let's um, move on here and then just continue with internships. The one thing I want to mention here with internship is uh, when I say program related, this is like internship that is built into the curriculum. For instance, again, I'm using Whitman's MBA program as an example. Uh, between year one and year two, we usually recommend uh, that our students complete a summer internship that goes towards their experiential learning portfolio. So it's built into the curriculum to accommodate or, or count towards credit for one particular aspect of the program. Okay. It requires completion of at least one year of study. So, which means if you are a um, if you are a student at a particular university and want to do an internship that counts towards your program as an international student coming to a U.S. university, you cannot engage in an internship without completing two semesters of study at least. So if you are starting in the spring semester at any university in your program, you cannot go into a summer internship right after. Keep that in mind. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Um, it is a federal law that you have to complete at least one year of study. 
Uh, it also requires completion of what is called the curricular practicum, uh, practical training paperwork, CPT paperwork, um, for credit. If you want to receive credit, you have to complete the CPT paperwork with your International Student Services Office. Um, the internship can be paid or unpaid. Uh, that does not determine whether you have to do the CPT or not. Everybody who wants to receive credit for the internship for the, uh, I mean, towards your program has to complete the CPT. And it can be in the US, anywhere in the US, or it can even be global. Um, this will be determined by your particular department if they say, yes, it's built into the program, you can do an internship, but it has to be only a US location. Or they can say it can be a global location. Okay, so that is something you have to figure out with your department. Non-program related internships, this completely depends on personal interest. You can undertake this internship during either the winter or summer breaks. No CPT paperwork is required because it is not going towards credit. Uh, it can be unpaid or uh, paid, but it can only be in your home country. You cannot engage in a non-program related internship in the US while you are a student at a US university. Please keep this in mind. You also cannot most likely engage in a non-program related internship globally. Uh, so let's say you apply for an internship in Australia while you are a student in the US and you're looking to be paid, it has to be tied in with something related to your institution. You just cannot show up over there and expect to land an internship with no affiliation um, whatsoever. So this can only be in your home country. So let's say you're visiting home for the summer or the winter break and you want to gain some experience after your first semester of study, you can try to engage in an internship. Um, and if you do land an internship, it can be paid or unpaid. You are not necessarily counting it towards your grade or towards any credits back, home, uh, back at your institution. So that ultimately is non-program related, helps you earn some money over there that you can later convert. How many credits is an internship generally equivalent to? This depends on your particular department. Um, at Whitman, we allow the student to choose whether they want to take the internship for one credit or three credits. Um, if they take it for one credit, that gives them extra leeway to take maybe a course to fulfill the other credits where they want to learn stuff or they can engage in a second internship. Um, so it, it, it really depends on your department um, about how they want you to file that internship paperwork. Okay, and for how many credits. And you also need to have a faculty member uh, listed as a supervisor because you have to show some final report or summary or what have you um, as required by your department. And therefore you will have to have a faculty supervisor listed on your paperwork for your CPT and for the company also to know that you will be submitting something to your faculty member at the end of the internship. Okay. Um, any other questions regarding internships right now? I've heard some universities count internships in OPT. Is it true? Okay, you're jumping the gun over here. You are going to graduation and the one year that you get um, towards OPT which is optional practical training. This is very specific to universities and departments, um, but I would not take this as a general um, availability that internships will count towards OPT. It depends on how the department approaches it and whether um, the university's International Student Center will allow that to happen. So it's very, uh, it, it may not be like a two month internship that can be counted towards OPT. Uh, if you are doing optional practical training, actually, you cannot be doing um, an official internship. It would actually be your working for a particular um, faculty member on a research project or for the dean's office or you're hired by a department at the university, something like that. Usually that is the case. So I wouldn't necessarily call it an internship um, where you are still a student um, gaining some amount of practical experience. Okay. Any other? Um, I think, um, and Nishant, were you trying to sort of, if you have 
if you go over the 12 month CPT period, then it cuts into your OPT, if that's what you're trying to get at. I don't see Nishan's initial question. Um, I've, oh, he says, do assistantships depend on campus size? Is that what he was asking? That was the first question he asked, and then he went on to ask if um, universities count internships in OPT. Okay. They may get counted into OPT if you exceed the 12 month CPT, then it gets counted into OPT, but not otherwise. Yeah, but that again depends on like whether you can do an internship for 12 months in the first place. Um, you, you want to keep right. in mind that internships will usually be during the winter or summer breaks, um, in rare cases, maybe through a semester. Um, as a student, if you are engaging in this kind of work to supplement your theoretical knowledge um, and are therefore doing an internship, uh, you would have to still complete the required courses for your program in order to earn your degree, right? So in very rare cases, depending on how your program is set up, you would be going over the two-month summer internship or a max semester. But um, typically for the internship to go for an entire year, 12 months um, on CBT, and then to actually go beyond that to cut into OPT uh, does not happen. So I would actually say that you want to talk to your international student center um, every semester because you might have to file paperwork for it every semester. And, and you also have to think about internships being awarded certain credits and grades. So you cannot just have something for 12 months and then not be graded on it, right? So you have to, figure, there will be other parameters that you would have to um, get details about before you can just engage in something like that. So again, be very careful if someone tells you you can take something for 12 months. It is not usually possible that you can do that. You might be able to extend something working on a project beyond a certain amount of time, but it usually will not be 12 months at a stretch. Okay, so let's move on and go to what do I have next? I have some sources of um, funding resources. So typically you want to verify that the university offers you um, funding and what resources they have at the university. So if it's the university website, um, if, you, if you look at this link, it says graduateadmissions.syr.edu slash funding. So do not always assume that you will have a link on the homepage that says funding or financial aid. Sometimes the Office of Financial Aid is listed under the broader umbrella of admissions. So you have to do some digging in and you have to go in there and look. So here is, Anu, can you actually see the web page or no? Um, I can see I can see the links. You mean um, I didn't get you about the web web page? I'm trying to load it. The first one I can see the first one. Graduate admissions dot syr dot edu forward slash funding. Right. So yeah, that's visible. So if folks get <laughs> that point, you can look at this and um, try to find your your um, web pages that I've listed here and then go over them to try and understand how you would do your searches in there. So. Right, all of them are opening. Yeah. Um, the next one I have here is one of the scholarship websites, which is the International um, Financial Aid and College Scholarship Search. I have actually done this when I um, was even at USIE at Chennai um, as an USA advisor, and I have actually directed some of my students to apply for scholarships from here. A lot of scholarships might be for undergraduates, but there are quite a few for graduate students, uh, especially women, and also for uh, engineering, the, the particular discipline. So you might want to keep in mind that these scholarships will be competitive, will require additional work from your end, and will require you to possibly prepare a different type of application um, as specified by the scholarship um, committees or organizations. And 
some of them may not be at the same time that you are going to begin your graduate study. Some of them might be like a semester after or in the middle of your first semester of the deadline. So you have to actually have a system to track these scholarships because I say any money or any amount of money is good money if you can actually win the scholarship. So you need to be a little diligent and try to focus on tracking these scholarships and um, my, you know, getting to the deadlines and submitting your stuff, and you stand a good chance of um, winning the scholarship. Indian organizations or trusts. I've listed one of the trusts over here, the Tata Trust, which actually has um, some individual grants. So if you look under individual grants and for education, they have scholarship programs and they have specific um, travel grants related to education or other types of grants. So I will research more into this and um, look at the Tata Endo Endowment for the Higher Education of Indians under individual grants and prepare <coughs> required to be able to apply for the 2016 round, okay, or 2015-2016 round. And then I've listed one American society and organization here as an example, AFME. Now, all of these, I thank Okay, so it's just doing relevant keyword searches that I came across these websites. Um, I don't have any specific magic list that I pull them out of. Um, but if you do targeted keyword searches on, on the internet, you can actually find a lot of different funding opportunities for international students that will suit your purposes. Okay, so ASM is just, American Society for Mechanical Engineers, and uh, they also offer specific scholarships for graduate study. In addition, I just wanted to add. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add that educationusa.state.gov also has weekly uh, listing of, of scholarships for undergraduate and graduate students. So if you log, to, log on to our website, I'll just type it again. I think there's a, there's a spelling mistake. Uh, you will be able to s sort of follow um, U.S. university scholarships in addition to what Sri has just mentioned. Sri, over to you. Yeah. So. Um, it, and, 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 I, and I suppose you guys are still doing this, Anu, but um, if you become or if you are already members at USIEF, there, there might be specific lists um, that are available with the offices, so you might want to check about that. But EDUSA also has on their website uh, under financial options for the five uh, steps to US study. They do have links to specific databases. Now, keep in mind, one of the problems with databases is that if they are not updated, then you have broken links. But does that mean that if a link does not work, you cannot find the information on your own? No. So if a link is broken, take the name of that fellowship or scholarship, plug it into the internet, and you will find the actual web page of where that link comes from, and you will be able to access the information. So don't just rely on the databases, but um, use the databases for your initial search. And one of those better ones is the one maintained by UCLA uh, called the GRAPES, Graduate Research and Postdoctoral um, Educational, I'm blacking out on the last one, whatever the S stands for. But you can get that at um, the, via the Education USA website that I'm just listed over here for you. So I think that brings me back to my last slide, which is, this is my personal email information here at Syracuse University's Whitman School of Management. Specifically, I recruit for um, MBA and MS programs at the B School. Um, so don't write to me and ask me whether iSchool offers a scholarship. I will not know the answer. Um, I will only be able to direct you back to iSchool's website, so you might be better off contacting them directly and asking them that. But if you do have questions um, in general, feel free to write to me. I can assist you in whatever little way that I can. I will try and help you out. But I would first say that before you contact anybody at any point, you want to uh, look through the website, understand what is provided, and I've given you an example with how stuff is organized at Syracuse University. Um, it's a decentralized system, which means that every department, every school has its own um, autonomy in um, their admission criteria and their funds. Okay, 
So questions. So that's fine. While Sri, well, you know, handles the, the call, I just want to tell you guys to join us, uh, join our Facebook page. Uh, like it and follow it. Um, if you are from Delhi, if you're from the northern region, then it's going to be facebook.com forward slash education USA Delhi. If you're from, if you're logging in from the southern region, uh, it's going to be uh, facebook.com forward slash education USA Chennai or education USA Hyderabad. Uh, uh, you, and you can, you can, you can, you, you'll get a listing of all our events and, um, all our uh, updates through our Facebook page. So look out for your regional center uh, on the Education USA website and join our Facebook page, like it and follow it to get more information on scholarships, funding opportunities, events related to the same. Okay, so I have a question in the chat box from a student, uh, Patik. All right. Oh, this is related to SOP. Um, that happens to be one of Shri's forte as well. <laughs> so that question follows you here. I, I know, SOPs are not letting me go anywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, so Pratik, your, your question basically was about whether you should mention um, why you could not do your master's in April 2014 and are now applying in 2015. Personally, based on the way you have uh, phrased your question, I would not mention it in the SOB at all. There is no reason for you to state that you did not have finances and therefore you did not choose to um, continue your study. Remember that U.S. education is, um, or one of the USPs of U.S. education is that age is not a barrier. And so, People do different things in life before they decide to pursue their studies. In, in the Indian system, yes, all of us, we are fortunate enough to be um, born into families where our only job is to be a student until we complete um, you know, our undergraduate and master's degrees and then go for a job. But um, here, that is not necessarily the most common route. People take breaks in between. And so the educational system is, is designed such that you can come into pursuing your uh, advanced study at any point in life. Having said that, your statement of purpose should basically address why you are applying for the program and be able to justify what you did in the one year after graduation. So if you're going to say, I spent the one year preparing for my GRE, wrong answer. Yes, you might have been preparing for GRE, but if that's the only thing that you were doing, too bad, but that's not enough. As a graduate student, you are expected to um, undertake a lot of different things, learn to multitask and be able to handle different uh, aspects of your life. So if you are going to state that you spent an entire year only preparing for a standardized test, that is going to look really bad on your resume um, and in your essay. So think about sensibly writing your statement of purpose to actually explain what you did in the one year since graduation, um, whether the time has helped you in uh, identifying what your career path should be and therefore has helped you narrow down the focus of your master's program. Um, what have you decided to do as part of your master's research project, what have you decided to uh, gain from your master's program in addition to just earning a degree, right? These are some sensible questions you should be thinking about uh, even otherwise. Don't write an SOP just because it's a template. Do not copy from online um, resources just because others have written it in a certain way that you have to use the same formula. All those wonderful websites, um, I'm blanking out on the names, but that offer you uh, former students, uh, offering you advice on how to write a statement of purpose, know that a student is a student, not necessarily an advisor. So please go to advisors um, who actually will look at your writing, will offer you content, uh, will offer you comments based on your specific content mm -hmm. and not just write random stories. 
Okay, and in here, as part of my role as um, Assistant Director of Graduate Recruitment, I am actually going to start interviewing for this next year for our ML students. And I have to read through essays, and um, I would much rather read a shorter essay that actually explains to me why you want to apply to my program and why you think my program will actually benefit you in your career goal as opposed to just randomly read some stuff about how you started getting interested in a particular field because somebody bought you a toy when you were three years old and that piqued your interest to learn more about batteries and electricity and therefore you became an electrical engineer. Okay, so think about what really applies. Have a roadmap for writing your statement. Explain what you need to. So again, coming back to your question, it's not so much that because you didn't have finances, you couldn't go in 2014. That's your personal story. If you really want to talk about it, you can disclose that at a later point. But what did you do in that one year that you graduated and now you're applying? That's the key thing that I want to learn and understand how you made use of your time, right? So that's my response to that. Sorry, it's a bit lengthy response, but I hope that helps answer your question. Any other questions? That's, that was that was really good response, Shri. Thank you. I'm sure the others have benefited from it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question, and that's just showing on your screen. If you provide a brief idea about loans that are available to international students planning to study in the U.S. So loans are... Um, the, the loans that I was referring to are the educational loans that local banks in India provide. So I'm, I don't know if uh, I, I know the names correctly. Anu might be able to help you out a little bit here. I know that you know banks like State Bank might, State Bank of India might have something, or uh, which are yeah, the there are banks, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the them public and private banks both that offer um, student loans uh, in, in the private banks you could look at ICICI, HDFC right. um, and the public banks as she said you could look at State Bank of India, State Bank of Bikaner and Jaipur, Punjab National Bank, several of them uh, you need to I mean we don't endorse any specific uh, uh, bank but you need to go to these different banks and really understand what are the terms and conditions and what is what is the interest rate you'll have to pay, what is the policy for uh, returning the money, and, and so on and so forth. Understand the terms and conditions properly, and then choose the bank that you think fits your requirements the best. Right. So once you, for, once you find out information about uh, how much collateral you would have to put up front in order to get X amount of money, what is the paperwork, you also excuse me, want to understand the timeline within which your um, request is going to be granted, not granted, when can you know? So that you can at least move on to another bank to find information or you figure out alternate sources of finance options. Um, international students coming into the U.S. looking to get a loan from a U.S. bank, bad idea for a couple of reasons. One, you may not be eligible. Um, actually, let, let's rephrase that. You are not eligible unless you have a guarantor or um, somebody who is a U.S. citizen who is going to give guarantee that you will pay back your loan, right? And most students who come into the U.S. Uh, usually do not have a guarantor like that. Um, it's also a risky option. Let's assume you do have an uncle who is willing to be the guarantor and try to sign for the loan. Think about the amount of pressure you're going to put on that person um, over here when they sign to get a loan from a local U.S. bank. So usually I would not recommend you go that route. I would say borrow in um, your home country so that you can at least pay off in your home country currency. Uh, if you borrow in dollars and you have to pay off in dollars and when you're actually going to school, that is going to be a tricky proposition. So think carefully before you uh, engage in loans out here, uh, even the ones that are available to international students, which are very, very few and would be, again, very university specific. So I would say um, 
stay away from those options, but try to get them from your home country as far as possible. Other questions? Um, uh, Shri, Shri, I had a question related to that. Uh, we Often we have um, students who come to us and they ask about universities offering some kind of a loan, some kind of a student loan, U.S. universities. Does that happen? Um, yes. And um, can you shed some light? Uh, for instance, when um, I was I was at uh, the EDUSA office in Chennai, I had a student of mine who applied for an MBA program and got into Duke. And Duke was offering uh, a loan system uh, where the university was signing off as the guarantor. So they had this huge paperwork that you had to fill out and, and do stuff, which he decided was the best option for him. So he decided to go that route. In those cases, the university sort of serves as the guarantor to the financial institution. Uh, but that does not mean that you are not liable to pay back. There are certain terms and conditions within which you will have to um, pay back the money and the loan would go towards your tuition, not necessarily your living expenses. So again, you're still possibly paying for your own living expenses and the loan would be paid directly to the university or there might be other legal jargon in there that you want to be very careful about. So um, as far as possible, I would again say without understanding the fine print and understanding how much time you have to pay back those loans to the university or to the institution or how you have to go about it, go over those details very, very carefully before you actually engage or get into any such loan system. And, and for that matter, you should be careful even if you're um, you know, applying for a loan in your home country as well. But at least over there, you have parents and extended family who are going to be looking at details and are familiar with the system. The added complexity you will have if you come in as an international student applying for a loan through the university, not that you will not have university personnel to help you. Yes, you will, but to understand it's a different system, right? So there are other things that you will have to watch out for as well. Okay, great, great, fantastic. So the idea is to sort of really understand where your options and choose the best option for you after understanding the fine print, getting to know about the pros and cons of every every financial, um, you know, uh, plan or way of funding your education. Do we have any other questions on funding uh, your studies in the U.S. to campus jobs? How can you access them? Um, or any other questions around? I think there is one question from Neho about what sort of time period is required before we can actually get an on-campus job. Um, there is no stipulation on time period for you to apply for an on-campus job. So which means if you're starting in fall of 2015, which would mean that you're starting your program August or September, depending on your university. Um, you can come to the university, finish your orientation. You need to have, uh, most often, yes, you will not be able to access the on-campus jobs database or website without having um, a university-specific email address. In order to get your university-specific email address, you possibly should have been um, enrolled in classes, which again is dependent on whether you have completed orientation or not. So there might be specific roadblocks at every stage. Until you finish all of those steps, you will not be officially considered a student at uh, the university. And once you have your email address, you might be able to access your on-campus job listings and actually apply for them. And if you get them, then you are welcome to take up your position, go sign the paperwork you will need a social security number. So that's another thing. Once you get your job application in, you will have to figure it out with campus officials as to how you go about applying for your social security number because that will have to be listed and you will be paying taxes as well, depending according to what your wage scale is and um, how the withholding pattern happens, which your university officials can guide you on. But um, typically to look for an on-campus job, you don't have any time period or wait like you have for the internships. You just want to be careful that um, you're not accepting a position that's going to interfere with your coursework 
for your course timings, right? So that's that's the only thing you would have to take into account. Right, Rick, can you tell us about some campus jobs that students can explore besides uh, the DAGA, RA? Um, what, what are the other kind of campus jobs that students can look out for? Um, you, you can get in multiple um, departments. When I was a student, I actually went to the registrar's office and I worked the front desk. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I worked the front desk, I was basically answering calls. I was, uh, it was like a, like a front office um, position. Um, mm -hmm. At the same, in the same department, I had other students who would work in uh, room and course scheduling to help with scheduling courses and scheduling rooms. Like how does your classroom you know, how does your course get assigned to a particular classroom? Because there is actually a department that does that. You could explore job opportunities there. You could explore opportunities to be a student assistant in the computer center. You could work at any department's um, IT section. Um, over here at Whitman, we have an IT section or IT department that's exclusively for Whitman. Um, staff, faculty, students, and so we actually hire student assistants over there to do front office, to do basic um, IT-related um, issues, to handle any kind of issues that staff or faculty or students might have. Um, there are student assistants in the computer labs here uh, at Whitman. So there are multiple options on campus that you can look at. Sometimes um, the cafeteria, actually not sometimes, most of the time, cafeteria positions are open, but a lot of students do not explore them, which actually is a sad thing. So don't be looking only for white collar jobs, okay? Um, there are a lot of different perks you get at different places. Um, people don't explore positions in the, in the uh, coffee shops, in, in the cafeteria, uh, the local restaurants, or affiliated to campus. Um, if you have a driver's license, when you get here and you can uh, drive on campus, possibly there is a Department of Public Transportation or so that might um, that might have some open positions for student assistants to transport materials from um, one department to another. Um, so you might be hired in that section as well. So multiple opportunities. So just look look around and see where you can um, get your best at. Okay, right. So, um, okay, so I'm just going to answer these two questions. Um, first one, does it, do assistantships uh, depend on campus sizes? Small campuses get less funding from government. It has nothing to do with government funding. So it, it, this is something that you want to sort of understand. Like, again, going back to what I said about assistantship, it depends on whether your department is able to get funding. Um, and your department gets funding in multiple ways. It doesn't necessarily get everything only from the government. The university gives it funding too. Graduate college can give it funding too. But how the funding comes is not necessarily um, dependent on small campus size. Because small campuses might actually have more money to distribute to all students, right? So think about it. Do the math. Um, if you have a huge campus and you have a lot of students applying, then there's only limited number that I can give out every time. But if I have a small campus and I have more money available, then I can give it to every student except I give less numbers. For instance, here at Whitman, every student who applies to our graduate program and gets admitted gets some amount of funding. Now the amounts will vary, but everybody gets some amount of funding, right? So that doesn't necessarily depend on campus size. It depends on how many assistantships are available and for what purpose, right? So that's department specific. Secondly, is there any preference to US citizens for on-campus jobs too? Not necessarily, unless it is something to do with um, where security clearances are required. Then yes, you have to be a US citizen for that. But otherwise, a lot of international students um, apply for on-campus jobs and they get accepted. One of the best places to try that would be the International Student Center. Um, most often what I have seen with Indian students is that they are not willing to get out of the comfort zone and want to only apply for assistance. It's almost like there seems to be a sort of stigma attached to going and working on campus 
in doing something else. I don't understand why. I mean, I got a PhD uh, from the University of Arizona, and I worked as a student assistant, grade A, when I first started filing in the cabinets. Okay, so I filed paperwork in the cabinets. I answered phones. I uh, sat in the front office. But what that did after one year, because they.